What's up, church? How y'all doing this morning? Good, good. Man, what a great day to be in the house of God. We're excited about today and about what God's doing, uh, not just here in this room, but, uh, but what he's doing out back with our kids, man. They're getting soaking wet right now. How about that? Isn't that fun? I uh, saw the fire truck pull up. I hope he just squirts some of them really good. Uh, but uh, man, if today's your first time here, uh, welcome to Connection Church. We're honored that you would spend uh, your weekend with us and your Sunday morning with us. Uh, and if you could, if it is your first time, we'd love for you just to do uh, one quick thing for us. There's a, a connection card in your seat back in front of you. If you'll take that card, fill it out at the end of service. Uh, we have a free gift for you in the hallway. Uh, also, we're going to donate $5 in your honor to A21 that helps fight human trafficking around the world. And so, uh, so just by doing that, you're making a difference today. If it's your first time joining us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, we'd invite you just to uh, text the word online to 706-979-2438. When you do that, we will, uh, we will just uh, love on you and tell you how much we appreciate you coming, but also we'll donate $5 in your honor as well to uh, 821 uh, for, just, uh, for just coming and joining us online today. So thank you so much. Um, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about a subject that I am incredibly passionate about. Um, uh, we as a church believe that with God, anything's possible. Uh, that he can transform your life in a, in, a, in a moment, in an instant. And so, and I believe if over the course of the next few weeks, if you will just implement what we're going to talk about over these few weeks uh, and some of the principles that, that we're going to talk about even today, that I believe the second half of this year, the, I'm calling it the second half because really uh, tomorrow is really when the second half starts for me because that's when people start going back to school in my house. So, uh, so, um, and so it, it, we believe, I believe that if you'll implement these things the second half of this year, you can see incredible breakthrough in your life. Uh, and the subject we're going to be talking about is spiritual disciplines. It's a subject that I've spent uh, a lot of time studying, a lot of time reading, a lot of time, uh, I wrote papers on it when I was in seminary, and if I were to ever write a book, I don't believe I ever will write a book, um, just because the, it's a daunting task and sitting down for long periods of time and just writing uh, beyond what I do for, for Sunday morning uh, just doesn't in interest me right now, and so, but if I ever ever write a book, I believe I would write on the subject of spiritual disciplines because it just, it just fascinates me. And so there's a few authors that I continually read when it comes to this subject. One being a, an author by the name of Richard Foster. If you've never heard of Richard Foster, he's got a book called Celebration of Discipline. It's a phenomenal book about the spiritual disciplines, about, uh, talks about all the spiritual disciplines, it breaks them down. And uh, he also has an incredible book on prayer. Uh, as well. There's another author by the name of Donald Whitney. Uh, Donald Whitney wrote a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Spiritual Life. Uh, same kind of format as, as Foster's book, uh, just from a different angle, from a different take. And so it, they're both good, good books to look at and kind of see, and they, they add spiritual disciplines in some of them that the other one doesn't have, and, and so it's good. And the third book that I always love to, that's on my shelf, that I always love to go back to is a, is a book by uh, the late author uh, Dallas Willard. Uh, and it's called the Spirit of the Disciplines. And so uh, what makes this one unique is there's a section in there where he kind of breaks down the disciplines and talks about them each, but he, he really relates it to our lives and how, um, we, how it's important and why it's important for us to have the spiritual disciplines in our lives. And so as I planned to preach this, my plan, uh, normally around this time of year, we always do a spiritual discipline series to kind of get us focused back on the beginning of the year. We do a, hey, let's get ready for the year. This time we kind of get us, hey, let's refocus because over time, what do we do? We, we kind of lose focus. And so we want to, we want to dial it back in. And so we believe that, I believe that we dial those things back in through our spiritual disciplines. And so uh, we normally, I take these and I talk about them. So I'll talk about prayer and fasting and Bible reading and worship and community and all this stuff. And so um, I, I usually do that and I plan to do that for this one. But as I was starting into this and I started uh, com composing my outlines and looking at my outlines for this, I really feel like God, uh, he pointed me in a different direction. He says, you know, where do, where do spiritual disciplines uh, originate? Where do they start? Well, we're in church, right? So the obvious and easy answer is what? Jesus. All right, that's, that's the answer for everything in church. And you, if you say Jesus in church, you'll never be wrong, right? Like you just say, hey, who, was on, who, who made the ark? Jesus. Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, like he gave Noah the, the, the ability. To, so like, you, you get what I'm saying? Like Jesus is never a wrong answer in church. But like, where do they originate? Like, where do they come from? And, um, and, and here's the thing about spiritual disciplines. Here's the thing about spiritual disciplines. I don't like the word discipline. 
Y'all like the word discipline? Like, I, don't, I don't like that word. As a matter of fact, as I was studying this and I looked up, the word discipline, here's the definition. And when I looked at the definition, it gave me even more distaste for the word. Okay? Here's the definition of discipline. It's the practice of training people to a, obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Now you see why I don't like You know what that sounds like? Religion. That sounds like Judaism. That sounds like what the Pharisees were all about, right? And I'm like, I'm like, Ugh. like I don't want to be disciplined like that. And so if the naming committee, which they didn't come to me and ask me, they, sh- they should have, right? That's, I think they should have. But if the naming committee would have come to me and asked me, what, well, what should we call them there, oh great one, right? Well, I think they should call it spiritual habits. <laughs> I think they should call it spiritual habits. Because here's the thing about habits. You can have good habits, and as we know, you can have bad habits. Now, we spend a lot of time thinking about the bad habits, right? Like I can, Because here's the thing about bad habits. They always seem to come back and bite us. Right, right in the backside, don't they? Like, like our, my bad habits, like I look at them like, ugh. I can always tell, but here's what we don't do. I don't think we look at our good habits enough and really see where they bless us. I don't think we really take the time to look at our good habits and see where they bless us. I've said this before, and I usually say it to my kids about their friends, is show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Meaning that who you hang around with, who's, who's in your peer group, uh, directly influences what you become later on in life. Well, I'm going to add to that. And I'm going I'm to I'm throw another one at you that I'm probably going to say a lot here. Show me your habits, and I will also show you your future. Bad habits, <laughs> you're, you're going to reap bad things, right? Good habits, you're going to reap good things. And that's what we want to talk about today, um, because here's the thing that I know. We want a better life, don't we? We all want a better life. I've never met anyone that says, you know what? I really just wish my life would get a little worse. Right? Have you ever met anybody that said that? I really just wish that my life would just go down a couple notches. No, we want a better life. Here's the thing I know about formulating habits. And if you don't write anything else or remember anything else about today, other than this, if you have your little note section in your, on your phone, Here's the thing that I want you to take away today. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Now, that's not an original thought to Mickey. I didn't come up with that. I I don't remember. I don't know who came up with it. Uh, I feel like I've heard Dave Ramsey say that a lot. I don't know why, but it feels like something Dave Ramsey would say. But I know I've heard Pastor Mark Batterson say that, pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C. I know I've heard Pastor Craig O'Shell say that, pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma. Um, I know I've heard other pastors say that. And so that's something that when they say it, like those are the things that I write down. I put in my notes section on my phone. I'm like, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And that's with any area of your life, spiritually. Spiritually successful people do consistently what spiritually unsuccessful people do occasionally. Financially, relationally, physically, it all, it all, it just all wraps around this one concept that you have to do. Uh, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And we see this in, in scripture. Like, if you just look at Jesus, it, like, he constantly made time to get away and pray. Like, not once in scripture did you ever see Jesus say, you know, I just didn't have time to pray today. I just didn't have time to spend with the Father. No, he, he regularly made, made it a point to get away, to, 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 to seek um, so, solace and, and silence and solitude and, and, and go and be in one with the Father. He regularly escaped the hustle and bustle. And look, he had hustle and bustle. Like you're talking about thousands of people were around him. Thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people were around him because he was healing them and he was preaching and they wanted to see Jesus. And so you see all these things, but he regularly made time. But, but, but we look at that, we say, well, oh, Mickey, that was Jesus, right? Told you that's never a wrong answer, Jesus. But look at Paul in Acts 17, 2. It says this, it said, Paul made it his custom. He made it his habit, in one translation, he made it his habit of regularly going to the synagogue and sharing his faith. He regularly created these habits in his life to make sure he was sharing his faith. But what I want to show us this morning is Paul didn't have it all together when it came to habits. 
You know how I know this? If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 7. And see if you can relate to Paul. In Romans 7, 15, it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. How many of y'all can relate to that? Man, I really want to do this. Like, I really want to eat healthy. I really want to, you know, I I really want to work out and be physically fit. But this box of donuts over here is just so appealing. Like, I don't want to eat this box of donuts, but when it's Krispy Kreme, how can you resist, right? And I really want to, like, I want to not eat it. Like, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, Paul's saying the things that I want to do, the things that I know I should be doing, I can't, I don't do them, I do the things that I hate. And he goes on and he says this in verse 18. He says this, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do, uh, I, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. What Paul, he's not talking about donuts. He's talking about his, his sinful life. He's talking about sinning. He's talking about, he's talking about messing up. Going against what God's telling me to do. So he's got these things over here, and, and he doesn't go into detail what it is. It would be a lot easier if, if he did, right? You know? Like it would be a lot easier if Paul told us exactly what he was doing. But he doesn't. He just says, he just vaguely says, I want to do these things over here. And I can't, I, I can't do these things. I keep doing what I don't want to do. And then if you flip down, or you look down in verse 24, Paul does what so many of us do. Really, all of us do this. He attaches what he does that he doesn't want to do to himself and to his identity. And he says this. He says, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man I am. Like, like, can you feel that? Like, we don't use that word a lot, wretched. But can can you feel just like like how he feels like dirty and nasty and no good? And he And he says this. He says, Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? He's asking this question. He's like, ugh, this filth I got on me. And I think he kind of backs up. He says, wait a minute. Ugh, kind of snaps out of it. And he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so what I want to do today is I want to maybe talk to us about I'm not going to maybe talk to you. I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> three reasons why we struggle to fulfill what we actually want to do. Three reasons why we have such a hard time doing what we really, really want to do. And like Paul, we do the things that we don't want to do. Because here's what I believe. I truly believe this in my heart. I believe if, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian... I believe in my heart that deep down in your heart that you have a desire to follow Jesus closely or closer. You have a desire to be in relationship with Jesus. You have a desire um, to, to, uh, to, to take steps closer to Jesus. I truly believe that. But we get caught up in, in doing what we don't want to do. And so I want to give you three things today. The first one is this. We focus on the what, not the how. We focus on the what, not the how. James Clear, who wrote the book uh, Atomic Habits, if you've never heard of that book, if you've uh, never read that book, I would encourage you. That's a phenomenal book. Uh, One of the best books that I've probably read on, uh, just in general, on habits and creating habits. He says this, winners and losers, successful and unsuccessful people all have pretty much the same goals, right? If you don't believe me, just think of this way. Today is July 31st, right? This is the last day of the last month of the year that we will not have college football uh, for the rest of the year. Can I get an amen, right? Like we're talking like, come on now. Well, here's the thing right now. High school football is getting ready to start up. College football is getting ready to start up. Pro football is getting ready to start up. You name it, whatever it is. Um, the, the goals are the same right now, right? What's, what, what's the goal of, if you walked into any team right now, any head coach, what would they say our goal is? To win a championship, right? 
I, I laugh. Um, it, I, I follow uh, SEC football. Not really SEC football. I, I follow the Georgia Bulldogs. I don't care about the rest of the teams. Uh, all the other 11, 12, 13 teams can, I don't, they, I don't care about them. Um, but, uh, but, but here's the thing. Um, so they had media days for SEC. Uh, and there was actually one person who voted uh, the Vanderbilt Commodores to win the SEC. Now, I think that guy needs his head checked, um, his heart checked, and everything above. Like, that's just, he's just, I don't know what he's thinking. But right now, in Nashville, the Vanderbilt Commodores, even their coach said, their goal is to be the best team in the SEC. Now, we all know that's not going to happen. That's not prophecy. That's just fact, okay? Like, but, but their goal is the same. The Falcons. <laughs> 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 you know, their goal right now is to win the Super Bowl this year. They're predicted to go 2-15. and 15. <laughs> Like, I'm just, but our goals are the same. Well, James Clear says in his book, he says, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. It's the how. We all have the same goals. It's how are we going to get there. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Another great book on habits. Uh, he says you got to start with the end in mind, which is the what, right? But then you have to reverse engineer it all the way back to where you are to figure out how to get there. You've got to know the how. You know, too often we just say, well, I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, how are you going to do it? I don't know. I want to get out of debt. How are you going to do it? I don't know. I don't know. Quit spending money? Well, that ain't how you get out of debt. Because I don't know about you when I say I don't want to spend money. Guess what I want to do? I want to go spend money, right? In our spiritual walk, we say, I just want to grow closer to God. How are you going to do it? Uh, go to church. Right? Like, I mean, that's not, that's part of it, but that's not it. Like, you got to, like, we don't spend real time focusing on a real plan on how we're going to get to the what. I made a commitment uh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, that my goal was to get up early before anyone else in my house and spend time in the Word of God and pray. And um, I was pretty good at it for um, a long time. Uh, I, would, I would, you know, do, get a couple months in and then I'd, I'd miss a couple days. And, uh, and then I'd, get a, I'd, I'd build up and I'd get maybe four or five months in and then I'd miss a couple days. And then I'd get the same, same kind of cycle for probably, you know, five, six, seven years. And then I said, I said, probably about three or four years ago, I said, you know, um, and we're going to talk about this more. Uh, it's like, if I'm going to be the pastor that I need to be, if I'm going to be the husband that I need to be, if I'm going to be the, the father that I need to be, this, I have to make this a priority in my life to get up early. And the first thing I do is spend time with God. And I know how many days it's been in a row that I've done that because the Bible app keeps, keeps, up, keeps it up for me. 1,198 straight days. I've gotten up, and that's the first thing I've done. And that was my goal. But how did I do that? Where well, I knew I had to get some other things out of my way when I woke up in the morning, right? Like I knew I had to, I had to, I had to keep some, some apps on my phone off of, of my phone to be able to do that. Like I gotta, I gotta start at the end. Here's what I wanna do, but how do I get there? What are the things I need to do to get there? A couple other things, like a couple, I think it's either two and a half years ago or three and a half years ago. I said, I wanna quit drinking soft drinks completely. And, and I haven't had a soft drink in at least two and a half years, I know. It's, it's a blur. Once 2020 got here, it just kind of goes, what, when was that? What, you know? And, and, but I had to say, well, what's my biggest thing that I do? What, what keeps me from... That, that I, where I always fail in, in drinking or going to get a soft drink. When I went and got gas, I would always go inside. I'd pay at the pump and then I'd go inside. I want to drink, right? Well, I said, I got to quit going inside. Now, some of that was, was financially motivated as well because they're expensive. You go to a restaurant, you order a Coke. Woo, man, it's three bucks. So now I just drink water. I just drink water. And there's been days, look, I, I promise you, there's been days where I've told my wife, I was like, oof, I really want a Coke today. <laughs> it usually happens when we're eating pizza. Because you know, like Coke and pizza, but I'm a Pepsi drinker, so I know I'm weird anyway. Amen. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, but like, but like, it's just like, 
You see, but you got to have steps that you know. If you want to get here, you got to have steps that you know. You got to focus on the how you're going to get there. That's number one. The second reason, and I know we can relate to this, the reason why we give up so easily or, or we do the things that we want to do is we don't see results fast enough. We just don't see results fast enough. I've been working out for a week and I gained two pounds. What's up with that? Right? Golly. And can I just say, if your goal is to lose weight, you probably need to throw your scale away. I'm just, I'm just saying. Like, that's the scale. All, you know, it sits over in the corner, and it, it just when you start to talk to it, it tells you, it just reaches out and says, you're not good enough. You ain't doing it right. I can't believe you. Like, it's, just, it's just a bowl of negativity just sitting over there just waiting for you. Right? Like, like at least it is in my house. The scale is my enemy. But to put this in a spiritual context, this is when we don't see results fast enough. God, I've been praying for two days and you haven't answered my prayer yet. I've been praying for a week and I haven't seen any results. God, where are you? And so we quit praying because we think it's not doing anything. We just say, Shh. you know, walking with Jesus is a marathon. <laughs> it's a long game. It's not a sprint. It's not a sprint. And here's what, here's what happens is we think the small decisions don't matter very much. We think the little things don't matter. Oh, it's just one day, right? It's just one day. I'll just skip it one day. You know, I won't get out. I'll, I'll, man, I know my alarm went off and I need to get up and read my Bible, but man, my sheets just feel really good right now, especially in the winter. Like, like, if, like if you're like me, I don't turn my heat up very high. It's like it's cold in the room and that, that comforter feels good. He's like, oh, I don't want to get up. It's easy. And we think that doesn't matter. It's just one day. And we don't see it add up fast and we think it's not a big deal. Put this in a different context for you. We'll go back to food. If I were to go home tonight and I eat a, a broccoli, right? That's about one of the only vegetables that I'll eat as long as it's got a lot of butter on it. <laughs> like, like, but if I eat broccoli every night for the next 10 or 15 years, like if I eat it tonight, I'm probably not going to see any results tomorrow. Fair? Like I'm probably not going to, nothing's probably going to happen. Like, like I'm not going to feel better. But if I do that for 10 or 15 years every night, like I'm going to start to see some results in the end of that. Contrast that to if I go home and eat a box of donuts tonight, I probably won't see anything tomorrow. <laughs> My blood sugar might, but, but, but like it probably won't see a lot of results. Tomorrow. But if I do that for 10 or 15 years every night, I won't be alive, probably, but, but, but I'm going to, like, you can be like, Mickey, you need to push away from the table a little bit, get on the treadmill, right? You see, small decisions, if I just do it once tonight, I'm probably not going to notice it, but if I do it all the time, you see, changing our spiritual habits for the good, changing our spiritual habits, build our faith life up. And so when life throws its curveball at you, because here's the thing, life's coming, all right? For every single one of us, life is coming. You can't get away from it. I'm just, welcome to church this morning, right? Here's your encouragement. All right? Here, here it comes. Like, something's coming. And, and, and when, you, when you constantly do the little things in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual habits, and you're constantly spending these times with God, when life isn't throwing anything at you, when it comes, you, you react differently. And people will look at you and go, whoa. Man, that they'll look at you almost like an overnight success. But you'll know all those times that you were able to say no to the things that you didn't want to do when you said yes to the things that you did want to do. You see, it's, it's the things that no one else sees that gets the results that everyone wants. Now, here's the thing. Here's what I know in, in this concept of not seeing things fast enough because we want everything yesterday, right? That's, that's the world we live in. Like, St Pastor Stan talked about that a couple weeks ago. Thanks to Burger King. We want it our way right away, right? right? Like, and like, we want everything like, like right now. It's like, I'm sure some of y'all were disappointed Friday night about 11.02 when you read your numbers. Like y'all wanted that money like right away, right? That $1.3 billion. Sorry. I, I, I am sorry because I mean, offering, offering plates in the back. But anyway, <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing. Like, we want it right away, and so we get, we, we get, we get frustrated when it doesn't happen, don't, don't we? 
And this is where I want to encourage you with Galatians 6, 9, where it says this, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So I just want to encourage you, keep in the little things. Keep making the small decisions because they matter. And and look, here's the thing I'll, I'll tell you in this. You may not reap that harvest until you're standing before God. That might be when your harvest comes. But keep doing good. So we focus on the the what, not the how. We don't see results fast enough for our liking. And the third thing is, the reason we give up is our distorted identity ruins our success. Now we saw this in Paul, right? He said, what a wretched man I am because I keep doing the things I don't want to do. I keep doing the things that I hate instead of the things that I want to do. What a wretched man I am. And his, he attached his identity to the things that he did. And he wasn't the only one that did this. Go back in the Old Testament. Go back to Moses. Wrote the first five books of the Bible. Y'all, if you've never heard his story, Moses was a phenomenal man of God. He was out in the, walking along the path one day and he walks up to this bush and it's on fire and it starts talking to him. I don't know about you, but if I saw that, I'd stop too. And the, the fire, the Holy Spirit out of the fire said, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. And he said, hey, you're the one that's going to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and, and, let the, and, and get him to let the Israelites go out of slavery. You're going you're gonna, to um, lead the Israelites out of slavery. And what does Paul, or, uh, Moses start doing? He starts saying, I can't do that. I can't talk. I can't speak well. So somewhere along the life of Moses, someone told him, boy, Shut up, you stutter. You can't, you can't talk. Just be quiet. You see, someone talked down to him and he attached that to his identity and it almost caused him to miss his destiny. And that's what we do. And what do we say? This is just who I am. It's just who I am. And listen to this cycle that happens here. You see, an unhealthy identity, when we look at ourselves, we look ourselves in the mirror, and this is, we, we say negative, bad things that aren't really true about ourselves. When we don't see ourselves as a child of God, when we see ourselves as a wretched man, like Paul says, an unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. And then those unwise, unwise habits reinforce our healthy identity, unhealthy identity. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. We don't see ourselves as godly. We don't see ourselves as a child of God. So we don't live, we don't live like we're godly. We don't live like a child of God. And, and the way we live reinforces the idea that we aren't a child of God. You see how that happens? It's our identity and, and we end up losing and we end up unsuccessful in what we really want to do because we're looking at, I just can't do that because that's, I, I'm not worthy. So here's what I want us to do. This is a different idea in creating goals and habits and and things like that. I want you to create who goals. Create who goals. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? I want to be a better parent. I want to be a I want to be a better follower of Jesus. Well, when you create those goals, whatever it is, I want to I want to be a healthy person. I want to I want to be a godly coworker. I, whatever it is, whatever your who you want to be is, because it'll be different for all of us, and there'll be different categories. You see, because when you say who I want to be, your identity starts to shape your actions. And when you know who it is you want to be, it's a lot easier to do the what. You feel me? So, here's the thing. I want to be healthy. Well, what would a healthy person eat for lunch today? Ask yourself that question. Because then it's a lot easier to go do the what. If a healthy person wouldn't eat what I have planned for lunch today, I should probably change my plans for lunch. Because if I'm a healthy person, I got to go eat what's healthy, right? What would a godly, how would a godly person react to this situation? Kind of take a step back. What would, what would Jesus do? You know, the bracelets, what would, they, they're back popular. They were popular when I was in high school, back in the mid-90s. The back, I see people wearing them now. Like, what would Jesus do? And really ask yourself, what would Jesus do in that situation? Because that's always a good 
thing to, to, to follow is what, what would Jesus do, right? Remember, I told you the answer is Jesus. I'll give you an example. This was kind of in just a change in identity and a change in thought patterns here. This was in, uh, uh, I think it was in the Atomic I can't remember exactly where it was. But let's say you're a smoker and you're trying to quit. And it's your normal smoke break at lunch, uh, at, at work, and uh, a, a coworker comes to you who you've, um, who you've taken smoke breaks with, and you go, and they come up and you say, hey man, you want a cigarette? No, I'm trying to quit. Well, when you say, no, I'm trying to quit, you know who you still identify as? A cigarette smoker. You still identify as a smoker. But when you say, no, I don't want to, I don't smoke, you know who you now identify as? You identify as someone who doesn't smoke. You see the change and shift in your attitude and, and just what comes out changes who, who you are as an, just what you identify as. It's a small shift. It's a, just a small shift. Because here's the thing. You see, when we change that attitude, what, what happens in there is what happens when you give your life to Christ. You see, when you give your life to Christ, the Bible says that the old is gone and that a new has come. And so when, when you identify differently, you can say, well, that was the old me. When our identity is found in Jesus, that was the old me. That was who I was. This is who I am. Romans 6 6 and 7 says this, For we know that our old self, who I used to be, was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. You see, when our identity is in Christ... When, it, when, it's, it, when our identity is not distorted, is not distorting our success, and we think we are who, what, uh, we, we are who, who we are is what we've done, things start to change. Because verse 18 says, you've been set free from sin. And you've become slaves to righteousness. Now that's the negative spin on it. That an unhealthy identity creates unwise habits and therefore unwise habits reinforces our unhealthy identity. But there's a positive spin to this. That healthy identity creates positive habits and positive habits reinforces our healthy identity. That's why it's important to ask, who do I want to become? Who do I want to be? What would a person that loves Jesus do? And I go back to the reason why I'm 1,198 days in a row is because I sat there and I said, well, who do I want to be? I want to be a, a godly pastor. And I don't think you can be a, a, a godly pastor away from this book. Okay? Somebody might contend that with me, but it's what I believe and that's what I'm sticking to. I don't believe you can be a godly pastor and not spend time with God, <laughs> right? And so I said, I want to be a godly pastor. I want to be a pastor who, 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 who believes God's word, who, who trusts God's word, who, who, who spends time in, in God's word. So, so, so when life throws me a curveball or when something in this church happens, I'm prepared to respond in a biblical way. Because if Mickey has to respond in a Mickey way, I don't know if you've ever been around me and seen me respond in a Mickey way. My mom and dad are here. You can ask them. They've seen it. <laughs> but when we say, hey, I want to be, be a wise steward of money. And so what do we say when we go to Target? What would a, somebody piped me, pipe, uh-oh, you're talking about me. <laughs> like, like, what would a wise steward of money do if they go to Target? Turn around and walk out. Right? Because you, you can't go to Target without spending 100 bucks. I promise. Impossible. It's crazy. Right? What would a wise steward of money do? Probably would delete Amazon off their phone. I still have Amazon on my phone if that lets you know anything. Right? Like, like, but you look at these things and you say, what would a healthy person eat? What would a person who is a healthy person eat 
for lunch today? If that's your goal, if that's what you want to be, if you want to be physically fit, you can't eat a box of donuts and expect to be physically fit. I'm proof, okay? Who do you want to be? That's my question. Something for you to ponder today. Now, let me, let me finish uh, with just a little bit of encouragement for you. I, I hope this is encouragement for you. Um, we're a church that says everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect and anything's possible. And I say this regularly that, that I'm living proof of, of that. Um, and you, there's, there's, it doesn't have to be this way, but I would guess because we're human that some of us are going to miss a day. We're going to miss a day where we don't make the wise decisions financially, where we don't make the wise decisions uh, physically, where we don't make the wise decisions spiritually. And we might miss a day. Or, or maybe even take it a step further, maybe what we deem maybe a little more serious. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with addiction and you have a bad day. I just want to encourage you and tell you that's not who you are. That's not who you are. Yeah, you had a bad day. We all have bad days. <laughs> you might have made a mistake. You might have messed up really bad. Maybe you messed up your routine and it, it you know, makes you mad. Maybe you've got 1,000... 199 days and you missed a day. Like if I missed a day right now just to ruin that streak, it would really make me mad. And I'd kick myself for it. Not that the streak means anything, but my encouragement to you today is James 4 says that God gives grace to the humble. And it's the grace that God gives us that's offered to us, each and every one of us, it's that grace that's offered to us because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. That our identity doesn't have to be wrapped up in what we've done. It can be wrapped up in who he is. That when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was bloody and he was naked and they had beat him and they pulled his beard out and they shoved the crown of thorns on his head, what he was doing in that moment was burying the dumb things that Mickey did, <laughs> has done, will do. And the same for you. And what he was doing in that moment, he was taking those things upon his back. And, and, and it says, by his stripes were healed. And what that means is when Jesus was on the cross, that it was our healing, not, not physical healing, spiritual healing. For the, from, 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 to be reconciled with the Father. Don't miss that. That verse in Isaiah, we, we want to use it for physical healing. But it's not necessarily about that. It's more about our spiritual healing than it is anything. That by his stripes, we're healed. The fact that he was on the cross for us is our healing. That we can go to the Father and stand before the Father one day and the Father can look at us and say, well done. Come on. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was taking the biggest of bigs and the littlest of littles. The big things that I've done, the really dumb things and the maybe not as dumb things. Here's the good news. Whether you've been a Christian for a long time and maybe you've strayed or maybe you've never taken that step. One confession of repentance. And you're there. This sounds easy. It's not that easy. <laughs> But it's one confession, repenting and turning to him and your identity is no longer in what you've done or what you think you've done or how bad you think it is or, or, or whatever it is over here. Your identity can, is no longer found in those things. It's now found in, in God's son, Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 5, 17 says the old is gone and the new has come. That we're a new creation. That, I love Ephesians 2 that says um, that, 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 that we, while we were dead in our trespasses, we were dead in our sin. 
And it goes on to talk, talk about how dead we were. And it comes to a point around verse four or five and it says, but God. It says he was rich in mercy. Christ died for us so we could be made alive in him. So my challenge for us today is who do you want to be? Make a commitment today. Who do you want to be? Because every single one of us, if you're a Christian, every single one of us, you can do it. I promise you. You know how I know? It ain't because of you. It's because of the Holy Spirit inside you. You don't have anything to do with it. If it were up to you, if it were up to me, right? But the Holy Spirit inside of you, just like Paul said, he said, and he looks in the mirror and he says, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. Jesus is the one that can transform me. Because of Jesus, I'm not a wretched man. You see, the Holy Spirit inside of you can help you break the things the habits, the bad habits, and put good habits in its place of all the things that keep you trapped, that keep you entangled, that keep you bound up. You know how I know? I've seen him do it. And if he's done it once, he can do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. So make a commitment today to be the person that you want to be. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you today uh, for your son. I thank you uh, for, for the simple life that Paul led, although we take it and we look at it as such a great life. God, uh, he was just in tune with, with who you are. And, um, and God, I just pray today that, God, we can look at, look at ourselves and look at um, who we are and, and say, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. We can say, thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of me, that Jesus inside of me is better than Jesus beside me. And so, Father, I pray today for my brothers and sisters, for, for our church family, for, for the people sitting here in the room and the people watching online today, God, that they make a commitment today to be the person that they, they, they want to be. And God, through the help of your Holy Spirit, God, I believe that they can do it. I believe with your help. They can, they can accomplish the goals that they set out. And so God, I pray today, God, that you would deliver us from our negative thoughts, our negative thinking, and who we are. And God, we're able to look to you and see your son. So Father, be with us. Cleanse us. Make us whole, make us right. Father, it's in your name we ask.